punch. Pastor Brito asked me to comment on the gift of tongues or the meaning of speaking in tongues in Acts and in the epistles. And um, so very briefly, he touched on, he dealt with this somewhat. Let me just say a few more things. There are three Babylons in the Bible. The first Babylon is the Tower of Babel. If you go back and ignore the chapter breaks, you'll find that at the end of chapter 10, the Table of Nations, that a group of Hebrews, the Joktanite branch of Hebrews, are moving to the east, and then it continues right on. When they came to the east, they built the Tower of Babel. And we already know that Nimrod was involved in building the Tower of Babel. So that's why uh, Pastor Brito was saying we have a sin of intermarriage going here. We have a city and a tower. We have a culture and a religion. We have Gentiles and we have Jews. It says the entire earth was of one vocabulary and of one religious language. Both of those things are going on there. And they combine, they build a tower, not this literally going to reach to heaven, but they build a ziggurat, a pyramid, and on the top of it, there's going to be a temple where they can contact their God. And everybody's in agreement on this. God, and they don't want to be scattered out over the earth. Well, God wants people scattered out over the earth, and He wants it there to be lots of languages. He wants to... He starts with Hebrew. This is very controversial. But there was some language that Adam talked. And there's only 1,656 years between Adam and the flood. <laughs> You're right. And these people lived 900 years long, so I don't think that language changed. Noah was speaking the same language that Adam spoke. And that then... The people were living 400 years and 200 years. I don't think the language changed again. I think that Hebrew was the original language. Of course, that's the old-fashioned view. Uh, and the only people who continued to speak it after the Tower of Babel, this original form of Hebrew, what we might call pre-biblical Hebrew, would have been the Eberites, the other group of Hebrews, Peleg and Joktan. Peleg, in his days the earth was divided. It says in Genesis 10. That means the Tower of Babel. I used to think it meant continental drift, but it might have been continental drift, but mainly it's the division of languages. Okay. God divided up the human race in the days of Peleg. It was his brother Joktan and his sons who got involved in the Tower of Babel. Peleg uh, brings us down to Abraham. Okay. We have a confusion of tongues Inability of people to understand each other and a defeat of Babylon. They wanted to make a name for themselves. God calls Abraham out of that and says, I will make you a name. Okay? That's the first Babylon. The second Babylon is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. And if you were to study the book of Daniel, as it happens, I have a commentary on Daniel if you can read you find that there's all kinds of Tower of Babel stuff in the first five chapters of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is building himself a tower. God graciously slaps him down and converts him. Okay, but when we get to Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar's feast, we come to the judgment on Babylon, and what kind of judgment is it? A hand writes on the wall and... Nobody can read it. See, another confusion of languages. So the second Babylon is judged with a confusion of languages. None of the people there can understand it. It says that the soothsayers and the wise men and the magicians, none of them could read what was written on the wall. God's hand wrote it on the wall. You have God's lampstand over here. It says they brought out the vessels of the temple, and the lampstand is here, and it shines the back of a hand on the wall, and it writes, what does it write? Many, many teklu farsin, which meaneth, you've been found, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. 
And that very night, Belshazzar the king was slain, and Cyrus took over the kingdom. What does the book of Isaiah say about Cyrus? What does it say? Cyrus is the Messiah. Let's remember what it says there. Okay, just so that we're getting... I mean, I'm not trying to preach another sermon, but if we're going to understand how tongues fits in with everything, this is a good way to get at it. So, Isaiah 44, the last verse of Isaiah 44, the Lord says of Cyrus, My shepherd, he will perform all my desire. He declares of Jerusalem she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus says Yahweh the Cyrus, his Messiah, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. Well, that literally happens. Belshazzar sees the words on the wall and it says his loins were loosed, which means he dirtied his trousers. That's what it means. Cyrus is going to scare these kings so bad that they're going to lose it. Okay? That's what happens. So, when this judgment on the second Babylon comes, with languages, instantly the old Babylon goes and Cyrus the Messiah comes and takes over. Now, that's what we saw today, isn't it? Okay. Judgment on the third Babylon because in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem is Babylon. It's called Babylon, drunk on the blood of the saints, and so forth. In fact, Jerusalem is Babylon already in the book of Zechariah. Why don't you turn in your Bible to Zechariah? Page 1320. Zechariah chapter 5. Starting in verse 5. These are the seven night visions of Zechariah. He sees a new creation. This is going to be the fifth day of that creation. Uh, No, it's going to be the sixth day of that creation. Uh, but we don't need to go into that part of it. On the sixth day, God made the man and the woman. So we're going to have the woman here. All right, that's the connection. <clears throat> but in chapter 5, verse 5, Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. So he says, Look up, look up in the sky and you'll see something going out, leaving. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. (laughs) This is all very clear in it. An ephah is like a big bushel basket. Okay? So there's a big bushel basket flying through the sky and going away. Again, he said, this is what they look like in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up, and there is a woman inside the ephah. And the angel said... This woman's name is wickedness. This is wickedness. And he threw her down in the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. So we've got to have a picture here. Here is this bushel basket, and there is an evil woman inside of it. And there's a lead cover on it. Got that, and it's flying through the air. I lifted up my eyes and looked. And there were two women coming out with the wind in their wings. And they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between earth and heaven. So now we've got another part of this. We've got a bushel basket here with the evil woman inside of it whose name is Mystery of Iniquity. Now why don't we call her that? Because that's what she is. And there's a lead lid on it. And there's two storks that look like women on either side. And they're flying this thing around. All right? You getting the picture? We can make a movie out of this. <laughs> and I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the ephah? And he said, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. This word very rarely appears. Shinar is where they built the Tower of Babel. Daniel chapter 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel and his friends to Shinar. And now it says, this is the third Babylon here, folks. The temple is built in the land of Shinar, and when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. 
This is the third Babylon, the third religious house, you know, a temple that reaches to heaven, a temple that reaches to heaven, Belshazzar's great feast, it's a religious ceremony, they brought all the gods out and praised all the gods, and now we have a third Shinar, a third temple, and the heart of this temple, the temple is built around this Ephabade. Now I want you to tell me what this is. It's round. It has a lead lid on it. It has wickedness inside of it. And it has a stork on either side of it. And there's a temple around it. What is it? Okay, well, this, 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 this is the... You're going to get it. We'll see who gets it first. This is kind of like, oh, wow, out of goose I am, you know. Eventually we're going to get it. It's round, not square. What? Okay, it's round. It has a lead lid on the top. Wickedness inside of it. There's storks, unclean animals on either side of it that have women's faces. And the temple is built around it. It's a counterfeit of the Ark of the Covenant. You got it. Okay, it's round instead of square. A lead lid on it instead of a gold lid. Wickedness inside of it instead of the law of God. Unclean storks instead of cherubim on either side of it. And a counterfeit temple built around it. Now this is the temple in Jerusalem in its bad side. Okay? These visions are all about rebuilding the temple after the exile. And what he's saying here. There's also a counterfeit temple. And in the book, in the Gospels, the temple of Herod is identified with that temple. Now we're still in Zechariah 5. We might as well just stay here today and look at all this cool stuff. Look at the first thing in Zechariah 5. The fifth vision. Okay, Zechariah 5 verse 1. Then I lifted up my eyes again and looked and behold... A flying scroll. There's a lot of stuff about looking here. Okay, This is important, but for other reasons. A flying scroll. A scroll flying through the air. And it's unwound. So this is a scroll that's been opened up. Okay, Not just rolled up, but opened. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Now that happens to be the dimensions of the holy place of the temple. Square dimensions, holy dimensions, the dimensions of the holy place in the temple or tabernacle. Actually, the tabernacle. But that's okay. That's what it's referring to. And then the angel said to me, this is the curse that is going over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing of one side, and everyone who swears will be purged away. That doesn't mean everybody who cusses now. It means everybody who swears falsely by God. Okay, a false oath. Will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. And I will make it go forth, declares Yahweh of armies. So this... The God of hosts is going to do this. It will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. See, And it will dwell in that house and consume the house with its timber and stones. Okay. If a house is consumed with its timber and stones, what's that talking about? This is Bible quiz day. It's talking about house leprosy. You, you were about to say that, I know. It's in Leviticus chapter 14. And if the house has red or green spots on it, the priest comes and he tears out the bad stones, he patches it up. If the stuff comes back again, he tears the house down, its timber and its stones, and drags it, drags it out of the city. Now it says here, the house of somebody who steals and who offers false prayer, right? Swears falsely by my name. 
Okay, now I want you to tell me, what does John's Gospel begin by saying about Jesus? In the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the incarnate Word. Who is this flying scroll? Jesus. It's always the answer. Jesus. The flying scroll is Jesus. What did Jesus say when he came to the temple? My house is to be a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. The two things here. Okay. And when Jesus came to the temple, he threw all the money changers and the bad people out of it, pulled out the bad stones. He healed a blind man, patched the temple back up. And when he came back in the A.D. 70, what did he do? Not one stone will be left upon another. The disciples look at the temple and Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another. That's the curse of house leprosy. So what we're being told here in this prophecy is, there will come a time when God's holy measurement, 20 by 10, will measure the temple and it will be leprous with theft and false prayer and it will be judged. So this passage, both of these parts are talking about a time when a future temple will become leprous, it will need to be torn down, and it will become Babylon. Okay? Are we there? And in Jesus' day, the temple has become Babylon. The city is Babylon. The temple is this leprous temple. He judges it. He leaves it. And when the judgment of speaking in tongues comes, that is the judgment on Babylon. Okay? That when it shows up, he's saying the Jews have become Babylon. Now, this judgment is particularly against the Jews. <clears throat> against the false worship leaders. At the Tower of Babel, we had false worship. At Belshazzar's feast, they brought out the vessels of the temple, including the lampstand, and they had false worship. The judgment now is going to be on the Jews for having false worship. Whom did the Jews worship? Well, not in Jesus' day. That's not what they said. They said, we have no king but Caesar. If you look in the book of Revelation, you'll find that the land beast, which is the Jews, served the sea beast, which is Rome. Now, of course, if you had asked those Sadducees and Pharisees, do you worship Caesar? They would have said, no, of course not. But you see, when they had a choice between Jesus and Caesar, they chose Caesar, which shows what was in their hearts. Okay. So they have false worship going on. The temple is a center of false worship. There's also true worship that goes there. It depends on who's going there, whether it's spiritual Babylon or a spiritual temple. Now, Isaiah prophesied. I may have to. Uh, I may have to find this. All right, I'm gonna find it. I didn't bring my Mark Bible. Uh, all right, but it's quoted in Procrate. Isaiah chapter 28. Verse 11. Isaiah 28 says this, this is a prophecy. He says, To whom would he teach knowledge, and to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just taken from the breast. For he says, I'm going to read this in Hebrew because you need to hear it. Sav la sav, sav la sav, kav la kav, kav la kav, ze ersham, ze ersham. It's the way children talk and the way they sing, sing song. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, kids always have these things. Order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to these peoples through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. That's how he will bring judgment upon the Jews. They will hear God speaking in other languages, not in Hebrew. 
He who said to them, Here is rest, give rest to the weary, said, Here is repose, but they would not listen. So the word of the Lord will be to them, order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there. Okay. Drunken speech. Childish speech. Barbarian speech. Now when we come to Acts chapter 2, what we find is you've got, you always want to count up now, 17 Jews from 17 different nations of the world, but what they say is, how is it that we hear them speaking in our own language to which we were born? They hear every language except Hebrew. That's the judgment on the third Babylon. You don't hear it in Hebrew. You don't get to understand it. And if there are people there who only spoke Hebrew, and by this time there really weren't, they spoke Aramaic, they didn't understand what the disciples said. So you've got Jews there, Jerusalem Jews, and the disciples are up there speaking. And they're speaking in Persian, or it sounds like Persian, and they're speaking in Elamite. But the people who speak Aramaic, the Jews, they can't make it out. So if they're going to hear it, they're going to have to ask somebody to translate it for them. Because they're not going to hear it in Hebrew or Aramaic. Now, as a, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm sure the disciples did speak in Aramaic you know, later on to various Jewish people. But this sign here is every language except the old language. Now, what is the permanent form of the gift of tongues? What language is the New Testament written in? It ain't written in Hebrew, is it? This is the inscripturated form of the gift of tongues. And on the judgment on Israel is if... If Jewish people want to understand the gospel, they've got to hear it in Greek. It's going to be read in Greek. You go to the synagogue and they say, oh, we've got a new letter from Paul here. They read it in Greek. That's not the sacred language. In fact, that's just plain fat out blasphemy to be reading so-called Word of God in Greek. You've got to understand if you're... You go to synagogue and how do they do it? Yeah, have, have, have any of you ever been to a synagogue? Okay. They have a pointer. They have the Hebrew text. They read a line of the text in Hebrew, and then they say it in English. They read another line in Hebrew, and they say it in English. Now, the synagogues of Jesus' day, they read it in Hebrew, and then they said it in Aramaic, because people couldn't understand Hebrew anymore. They always read it in Hebrew first because that's the sacred text. And then they would translate it or give the sense of it in Aramaic. You already see this happening in the days of Ezra. It talks about how the people couldn't understand the text when Ezra read it. And so the Levites gave the sense of it in the sermons. Okay? Now we get these letters from Paul and they're just reading them out in Greek. Just think how scandalous that would be. How offensive it would be. You're saying that God's holy language of Hebrew, which we've spoken ever since Adam, which God spoke when He spoke the world into existence, that's what they believed. I don't know if it's true or not. That that's no longer passe. That's no longer God's language. God is, God is writing stuff in Greek. How blasphemous that is. How shocking. What a judgment it is. And now, as a Jewish person, I have to go in here... The gospel come to me in this foreign language. And it's particularly Jews who have this problem. Um, when we get to the book of 1 Corinthians, it's the only other place that talks about this gift of tongues. Well, it comes up in Acts as a sign that the gospel is going to the Gentiles. It happens two or three more times. There are always Jews present, and it's always a sign to the Jews who are present that the Samaritans, that Cornelius the Gentile, and that uh, the disciples of John the Baptist, that the gospel is going out further and further into the Gentiles. But we find that tongues was really going on big time at the church of Corinth. Why was that? Anybody know? While you try to remember it, I'll, I'll try to find it. Oh, this is not my marked Bible. Come on, Bible. All right. Acts chapter 18, 
After these things, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a certain Jew, emphasis here, named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded, the, the emperor Claudius Caesar, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he came to them, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Of course, that's significant. This points back to Bezalel and the Holy Ab, who built, who made the tent of the tabernacle, and Paul is, you know, his very trade has to do with making a tent, making a church. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself entirely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own hands, I am clean. From now on I shall go to the Gentiles. Now here is the, the uh, special verse. And he departed from there and went to the house of a certain man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, that is a Gentile believer, an old-fashioned God-fearing Gentile like Cornelius, already a worshiper of the Lord, now becoming a Christian, whose house was next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and were baptized. Now, in other words, where is the synagogue? It's right on the other side of this wall. We're in a city here. You know, this isn't a suburb with houses and yards and trees in between. <laughs> this is a city. So right on the other side of this wall here is the synagogue. And when they heard the Christians speaking in tongues in the church, who heard it? All the people in the synagogue. So it was a sign to them. It was a sign to all those Jews right next door that judgment had come and that the gospel, that the kingdom was being announced in this other language. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when Paul talks about these things, he says... Uh, in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, we'll start there. Brothers, don't be children in your thinking. In evil be babies, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written. This is interesting because this isn't quite in the law. It's in the prophets, but you see how these words are broader than we think they are. In the law it is written, and he quotes Isaiah, By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. So then... Tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. It's a sign to the unbelievers, and it's a sign to unbelieving Jews. By strange tongues, I will speak to this people. Okay? So now this, this sign aspect, you see, of the gift of tongues, that ended in, in the year 70. The... The Jews were no longer God's special people of old. He gave them 40 years in which to kind of get the message. And then he brought judgment on them in the year 70. Now, they're, they're still Jews after that. But they no longer have the position in prophecy that they had before. So God's speaking in other languages today is not necessarily a sign to the Jews. It might be offensive to some of them uh, to be told that the Messiah is revealed in Greek, in English, not in Hebrew. Uh, but it's not quite the same thing. The abiding form of the gift of tongues, as Yuri said, as Pastor Brito said, is the fact that the gospel is translated into every language. Sort of the first version of it is here. There's a little bit of anticipation of it. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. The first version of it is here in the fact that there's, it's all in Greek here. The New Testament's written in tongues. It's not written in Hebrew. Every language you said Hebrew is tongues. Uh, the other question that comes up is exactly how these miracles work. It seems as if in Acts chapter 2, the disciples were standing up and speaking and everybody was hearing them in a different language. It seems as if in 1 Corinthians 14, people were getting up and talking in other languages that they hadn't learned before. And that's what was going on. So it wasn't a hearing miracle, it was a speaking miracle. It's hard to know. 
And of course, every now and then you hear a story of a missionary who goes somewhere and God just miraculously allows him to speak, you know, the gospel. I mean, I don't, we don't eliminate that God can do miracles by saying that the specific form of this is gone. Okay. What it's not is glossolalia. Glossolalia is what our Pentecostal friends call speaking in tongues. It's not a real language. Uh, and you can learn to do it if you want. <laughs> Hindus do it. Uh, Mormons do it. I mean, it's just like laughing or crying or whistling. You can learn to do it. And if you do it to the glory of God, I'm sure it might help you. I mean, any more than whistling a happy tune to the glory of God or something else. Or laughing. I mean, we could have a laughing revival right here and laugh to the glory of God. But I don't think it really counts for very much. Paul says it's better to worship with your mind engaged. So we don't go for that, although we recognize our brother's uh, erroneously identify glossolalia with xenolalia, which is this, that's what this is. Speaking other real language, xeno, other, different. Any questions about this? Before I launch into my hour long lecture on that I was planning to give. Just kidding. We'll stop with this. You see, there are three Babylons. Babylons are judged by God bringing a language judgment and moving history out from where it was. The Tower of Babel, they wanted to stay there. They didn't want to move out. God says, uh, you've got to move out. Babylon, God judged by bringing in Cyrus the Messiah. Both of those things happen here. The gospel is going to go out. It's all these other languages. Okay. The yeah. Purpose of tongues as sort of a foundational purpose as well, right? In terms of establishing the church. So there's sort of a dual emphasis where sort of establishing the church, but then it's necessary as a condemnation of Yeah, yeah. I mean you've got you've got these seventeen nations, actually Jews from seventeen different nations, but they talk about how you know, the language we grew up with was Parthian or Persian or something. So, you know, they may be Jews by race, but they've been living in these other places a long time. And they've got these other languages sort of as their home root language. And so it starts there. And, uh, yeah, we are establishing the church in her now glory fullness. So what was in one language, now God wants to be praised in all languages. And every language has its own slant. Every language has its own musical tone. Every language has its own way of putting words together and grammar. You know, one of the things that you find if you're a Calvinistic theologian is you start reading Dutch theology and you think, man, this is hard to read. Well, it's because it was written in Dutch. And the Dutch language puts words together differently from English. Uh, I had to help translating a Dutch work one time. My professor, Dr. Kistemacher, had translated it into English and if I had read it out loud to you, you'd die laughing. No, it's kind of like those instructions on your Xerox machine that were translated from Japanese into English. Uh, it was wild. And, you know, I sat, he had me sit down with the typewriter and put it into more idiomatic English. But we just had to, we had to cycle it through in order to get it out of Dutch into English because Dutch is really quite different uh, in the way it puts things together. And that means you wind up thinking slightly different about God, which God likes. He likes to have all these different perspectives on who he is. So the one perspective of Hebrew now becomes, over time, millions of perspectives with millions of languages. And throughout all eternity, we'll learn all those languages and learn to sing in all different ways. And, and our knowledge of who God is will increase exponentially as we do so. So, yeah, there's a foundation being given here. And the numbers, the numerology takes it up. You've got 70 nations in the Old Testament, which is 10 times 7. You've got 10 plus 7 nations here. And when Jesus has the disciples fish in Jack, John chapter 21, they get 153 fish, which is what? It's the triangular of the number 17. 17 plus 16 plus 15 plus 14 plus 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9. That's ancient numbers work that way. So, 70, 17, 153, those are all 
compounds of the nations of the world. So now all nations are being established. So yeah, absolutely right. That's another way to look at it. But the sort of the, the essential thing I think that people miss about the speaking in tongues in Corinth is that the Jews are right there listening in. And Paul says this is a judgment to these people. So at least in that situation, that's the emphasis he's making. Anything else? Do you want to follow up on that? Or do you have another thought along those lines? Just, just for the clarification of the book of 1 Corinthians 14, 15 to 13, when he speaks of the prophets will pass away, sons will cease, the knowledge will pass away. We know in part in the prophesied in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Tongues serve as a partial. Yes. Tongues are clear with the partial there. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I accept sort of what I think is a traditional Reformed view here, that the perfect that is being spoken of here is the completion of the Bible. That, in other words, you have, you have a kind of... Mora- let, me, let me just back up. This is another thing we can say about this whole business of miraculous gifts. Every time God starts a new covenant in the Bible, He starts it off by doing miracles and then it settles down. And the miracles he does are miraculous versions of the period that follows. So, uh, when God brings Israel out of Egypt, he does all these plagues against the Egyptians. Miraculous plagues which destroy their world. You know, the first plague is against the Nile, and then frogs come out of the Nile, and then dust on the earth, and then gnats in the air, and then cattle are dying and then hail comes out of the sky and then the sun is the judgment on the entire Egyptian world. Now from there we go into the land of Canaan and in much more normal kind of warfare we do the same thing. God still works with his army but we don't have miraculous you know, events. We have ordinary events that also had to do with tearing down a sinful world and establishing a new one. Similarly, when you get to the prophetic covenant with Elijah and Elisha, the new thing that happens there that's never happened before is all these resurrections. Elijah resurrects a little boy. Elisha resurrects a little boy. And they throw a man into Elijah's, Elisha's tomb and he comes back to life again. Now, all these miraculous resurrections, they don't continue on and on. They're just right there at the beginning. But that's a sign... Then the prophets begin to prophesy and they say, Israel is going to die in exile and be resurrected. So what happened in a miraculous sign way to start with, then is continued out in a normal way. The same thing is true of the New Testament. You have a period of miraculous prophesying, a miraculous speaking in other languages that ends because that's the foundation, but we still have the same thing. We still prophesy in the sense that the Spirit works in our midst to help us to know what to do. Okay? And that's a prophetic function of the community. Okay? We still have people who are pretty good at foreign languages and who wind up working for Wycliffe, you know. They've got a little shade of the the gift of tongues. All these things are still there, but in the more general form. So, there is this establishing aspect of the miraculous... And I think that's what Paul means when he says the partial aspects are there to finish out the Bible. Once the Bible has been given, it's now the foundation. It's perfected. At least that makes the most sense. Every time I have been asked to look at that again, I've just come back to where John Owen and Warfield and everybody else did. If you put the passages together, it seems like he's talking about you know, the, the perfection of the New Covenant revelation and the completion of the Bible. That's why we don't need to have miraculous prophecies anymore because they're all here. Or not. But I think I'm right. Or let's put it this way. I think that the Reformed tradition is largely right on that. Yes, sir? What do you think of faith in the 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 people? I think there there are people out there who, uh, through whom God more often heals by the imposition of hands than he does other people. 
I think the normal way to do it is to have elders come, anoint, and lay hands. And, uh, and the person is raised up. The, the passage says that the prayer of faith will raise him up, which means if you anoint with oil, the person experiences resurrection. Now, he may be resurrected to a life of martyrdom. <laughs> In other words, not be healed physically. But he will be, he'll be restored to uh, life in faith, that the despair will be taken away. Um, but I don't discount, I mean, nobody has the ability to walk through a hospital and empty it. But there do seem to be people who from time to time they say, uh, I just felt like this was a person I should go in and pray for and lay hands on. And whenever that happens to me, something seems to happen. And I don't discount that especially in situations where the kingdom is young, like some African tribe or some place where people are caught up in the demonic realm. Missionaries tell stories about miraculous things happening right at the outset. They kind of smack down the demons and are confirmation signs to the natives, you know, what we call natives, the pre-Christian people, that the kingdom is real. I, I don't think we ought to discount that at all. I think those are just lesser examples of what God does here at the beginning of the kingdom as a whole. Well, it's quarter past. I know you'd like for me to talk all day, but maybe we could stand and close in prayer and then sing the doxology. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have the privilege of living in the new covenant where we see the kingdom going out in all the world. We ask that we would keep that vision before us and uh, enjoy the fact that you have called us to this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here before. Praise Him above me, heavenly.